The Federal Reserve Bank has said time and time again that the inflation that we're seeing right now is just temporary. Well, Michael Birdie, the person who made a fortune shorting the housing market before the 2008 crash, says that the Federal Reserve Bank is lying and that the inflation that we're seeing is just getting started. What's up, everybody? I am Justin Pratt Singh from the MinorityMindset.com, where money minds rethink rich. Ever since we started to see housing prices and grocery prices and car prices grow, the Federal Reserve Bank kept coming out saying that this inflation that we're seeing is not real. It's just here for a short period of time. First, the Federal Reserve Bank said this high inflation was temporary and that it would quote, wane. Then after that, the prices of things started skyrocketing and people got very skeptical. So the Federal Reserve Bank came out again and they said that they think that this high inflation is still quote, temporary. And they even got the government behind it because then President Joe Biden came out and he said that inflation is temporary and that the Federal Reserve Bank should do whatever it deems necessary for the recovery of our economy. Now, the interesting thing about this type of temporary or transitory inflation is it doesn't give us a time span. We don't know what temporary means. I mean, even Wall Street Journal came out and they dug deeper into this and they said that the Federal Reserve officials see this transitory inflation lasting quite a while. So it's kind of impossible for us to understand if transitory inflation means two months or 20 years. Well, after the Federal Reserve Bank's latest meeting, they stuck to their guns. They said that yes, inflation is a little bit higher than what they expected, but they still believe that this inflation is temporary and they expect it to cool down. But Michael Burry called BS. He says that the Federal Reserve Bank is quote, lying. Let me go over an NPR article that covers what happened. At the end of their most recent reading, the Federal Reserve Bank that inflation is expected to be something around 4.2% by the end of 2021, which is higher than the estimate of 3.4%. And the reason why we're seeing this higher inflation, according to the Federal Reserve Bank, is because of the supply chain bottlenecks and shortages because of the pandemic. There are three main issues that Michael Burry has. One is the amount of inflation that we're seeing. He says that the Federal Reserve Bank is lying about the amount of inflation. Second is the cause of inflation because the Federal Reserve Bank is blaming it on supply chain issues. Michael Burry says it goes a whole lot deeper than that. And third is how fast we're going to cool down from this inflation because Michael Burry says we have more inflation coming. So let's jump into Michael Burry's reasoning. But before we get into that, I need you to do me a quick favor and smash that thumbs up button below. And if you are interested in learning more about how to invest your money in the stock market, you can get a free 10 day trial to our stock market insiders program, which is a weekly group coaching program for stock market investing. You get access to a weekly mentorship call with one of our stock market coaches who's been investing for years and has at least six figures, if not seven figures in the market. So they know what they're doing. You get to ask them questions and you get access to an exclusive community of serious investors. You can try it out for free with a 10 day trial. So if you're interested in being a stock market investor, not a trader, this is not made for traders. This is made for people who want to be fundamental investors who want to know how to research companies, how to analyze companies, how to read cash flow statements, how to understand earnings calls, and how to find an undervalued company. If that's something you're interested in, you can try out Stock Market Insiders for free with a 10 day trial using our link in the description below. After the Federal Reserve Bank told you what I just said about inflation, Michael Berry went out onto Twitter and he tweeted, quote, regarding inflation. So at Federal Reserve, are you lying to us or are you lying to us? And then he quoted an excerpt from a Wall Street Journal article. In the second part of his tweet, the excerpt, I'll explain what this means in just a second, but Michael Burry essentially talked about how Jerome Powell openly misconstrued the data to make it seem like inflation is way lower than what it actually is. And this is why he says that the Federal Reserve Bank is lying to the American people. Now, in order to understand what this article is talking about in the Wall Street Journal, you need to understand the difference between CPI and PCE. These are two different inflation measures and CPI is also known as the consumer price index. When most people are talking about inflation, they're looking at the CPI index. This essentially tells you how much inflation that there is. And when the CPI index tries to factor in how much inflation that we're seeing, they average out eight different industries. I'll just show you a chart from Investopedia so you can see what these industries are. They include apparel, so clothing, transportation, education and communication, so college education, other goods and services, recreation, meaning things like gym memberships, medical care, food and beverage, and housing. So the CPI index looks at those eight different categories that I just talked about, and then to see whether the prices went up or down. And based off of that, they come up with their own inflation number. And this kind of gives you a gauge of how much inflation you're seeing on average across the board in the country, because most of our expenses fall into those eight major categories. So when you hear the news talking about inflation going on, they're usually focusing here on the CPI index, but the Federal Reserve Bank doesn't look at the CPI index. Instead, they look at something called the core PCE index, which stands for the core personal 
Consumption Expenditure Index, and the Core PCE Index looks at something very similar to the CPI Index, except PCE, the Core PCE, does not look at the cost of food and does not look at the cost of energy. So things like gas prices. This is not included in the inflation numbers that the Federal Reserve Bank looks at. Why? Because they feel that this gives a better gauge of the inflation that regular people are seeing. Although, you know, energy costs do factor into the price of everything you pay at grocery stores because if gas prices go up, that means trucking costs go up, which means shipping costs of all your groceries go up, which means the price of your groceries are going to go up. And food costs are obviously a factor that a lot of people have to deal with, but the Federal Reserve Bank feels that this is a better index for them. Now, this is where it gets really interesting because if we dive into the Wall Street Journal article that Michael Burry was referencing titled Inflation's All Over the Place, it says, quote, when coming up with inflation numbers, Mr. Powell used a gain from the Dallas Fed that throws out the top 31% and bottom 24% of the personal consumption expenditure PCE price changes. What that means is when the Federal Reserve Bank was coming up with their own inflation numbers, not only did they look at the PCE number, but they looked at a derivative of the PCE number. What they're saying is they looked at the PCE number, they took out the top inflation numbers that they saw, they took out the bottom inflation numbers that they saw, and it looked like inflation wasn't that much. So what they did is they created a chart like this with a whole bunch of data points of all the different inflation numbers that they saw. They saw that some things did not grow in price that much and some things grew in price by a whole lot. This is the PCE chart that the Federal Reserve Bank looked at. Then what they did was they said, you know what, we're going to remove all of these. So the top 34% right here, 34%. They just removed it off of the chart because they said that this was an outlier. And then they also went out and they removed these data points right here because they said that this was also an outlier. So they removed the bottom 24%. So now it looks like inflation didn't really grow that much because he took out the extremes and he took out way more of the higher extremes than he did the lower extremes. This is what Michael Burry is talking about. Not only did they look at the PCE data, but then they took a derivative of this data because they got to pick and choose which inflation numbers they wanted to look at. And because of that, they're able to come out and say that inflation isn't as high as a lot of people think it is, although you're the one that's paying the price when you go to the grocery store and have to buy a car and have to buy a home because the Federal Reserve Bank, when they're looking at inflation data, they're skewing it, and this is public data. This is what Jerome Powell, the chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank, said. He said that they looked at the PCE data, they removed the top, they removed the bottom, and then they looked at the average right here. Let me show you what this chart actually looks like so you can see the difference. So the Wall Street Journal shows two charts in the same article. One has the trimmed PCE inflation numbers that we just talked about, where they removed the top and the bottom, the top 31% and the bottom 24%. And you can see that between 2013 until now, inflation looks pretty even. It looks like inflation hasn't happened that much. And then the Wall Street Journal shows a second chart created by the Federal Reserve Bank. This was also a trimmed PCE calculation, but this one, they trimmed the top 16% and the bottom 16% to make it a little bit more even. And you can see that between 2013 until now, we've seen a lot of inflation and a lot of it happened after 2020. I mean, you can just see that peak just boom, straight up. So now if we go back to what Michael Burry said in his excerpt, what he said will make a lot more sense. The excerpt says that when the Federal Reserve Bank is looking at the inflation numbers, they're throwing out the top 31% and the bottom 24%. And this is the reason why the Federal Reserve Bank is able to come up with their inflation numbers saying that inflation is not that high. And then he goes on to say that even if you look at the alternative measure, where you just remove the top 16% and the bottom 16%, you'll see that there's no support to the idea that inflation is already starting to come back down because inflation is still going up. And according to Michael Burry, we're just getting started. So this is why Michael Burry says that the Federal Reserve Bank is lying to us. They're skewing their own data to make it seem like inflation is not that high. And because of that, they can continue with their money printing. They can still justify all the things that they're doing to continue printing money and injecting this money into our system to continue ramping up inflation. Because according to them, hey, inflation isn't that bad. But the real inflation that people are seeing is way higher than what the Federal Reserve Bank says because they can just create their own data. But this is where it starts to get even more interesting because now you have to ask the question, why? Why does the Federal Reserve Bank want to skew the data to make it seem like inflation is not as high as it actually is? To understand that question, you need to really understand what the Federal Reserve Bank is because although it's called the Federal Reserve Bank, it's not really a bank because you and I can't go there to deposit money. 
and it's not a reserve because they don't keep cash reserves, and it's not federal. It even says so on their website. They are a separate entity from the government, and they have a lot of influence from very wealthy people, like banks. The Federal Reserve Bank's job is to monitor the monetary supply, and one of the ways that they do that is by making sure that big institutions like banks are well-funded and make sure that they have the cash. That way they can keep the credit system alive, because if you go to the bank and you cannot get your cash out because your bank loaned all their money out because Bank of America got a whole bunch of people wanting loans, so they loaned all their money out, that wouldn't look very good. So the Federal Reserve Bank makes sure that banks Banks like Bank of America have access to cash, that way they can keep giving you your deposits back, and they make sure that these institutions have access to money that they can continue lending out, because if banks don't have money to lend out, the economy will slow down. So the Federal Reserve Bank really works to make sure that our monetary system keeps running the way that it is. And since that's what the Federal Reserve Bank wants to do, they will be willing to do whatever it takes to make sure that these banks and big institutions are well funded. Like when we saw the 2020 crash happen, we saw the stock market in free fall because everybody was worried about the economy, everybody was worried about the pandemic, nobody knew what was going on. Well, that's when the Federal Reserve Bank came out and they started a program where they said that they would print an unlimited amount of money, unlimited quantitative easing, where they would just pour money into the markets. They would pour money into these big institutions that would, even if they had bad assets that were worth nothing, these institutions could sell these bad assets to the Federal Reserve Bank and the Federal Reserve Bank will continue paying them top dollar because the Federal Reserve Bank has the ability to print money on command. So when we saw the stock market in free fall, you saw it all of a sudden turn around and go back up because the Federal Reserve Bank opened up the money printer and they promised that they will do whatever it takes, meaning unlimited money printing, unlimited quantitative easing, that's what they said, and they will continue just funding money, pouring money into the markets, that way investors feel confident voting their money in the market. Now, this money printing comes at an expense because our money, our paper dollars, are really just a piece of paper. It is a piece of paper that's not backed by gold or silver or anything tangible, and because it's just a piece of paper, the Federal Reserve Bank has the ability to print this money essentially on command. Now, there is a cost to free money. In fact, some of the most expensive kind of money that there is is free money because as you print more and more money, yes, you can inject more money into the system, but this causes more inflation because as more and more money is printed, the value of each individual dollar that you have goes down. So now for the average person, the value of your savings isn't worth as much, your paycheck isn't worth as much because the Federal Reserve Bank has printed so much more money. So this money gets printed, it flows into these big institutions, and now the average person is paying the price through higher inflation because now your savings and the money that you're making from your job don't have the ability to buy as much stuff because your groceries are more expensive, your vacations are more expensive, your healthcare costs are more expensive, your rent and your mortgage are more expensive because home prices have skyrocketed, and so you're seeing more and more inflation because of the money printing and now this brings us to the question of now if this money printing is causing inflation why does the Federal Reserve Bank not want to say that we're seeing more inflation well at the time of me recording this video the Federal Reserve Bank is still printing something around hundred and twenty billion dollars every single month and pouring this money into the markets. Every single month, the Federal Reserve Bank goes out, they print another 120 billion, and they inject this money into markets and institutions so investors feel confident investing their money into stocks and investing their money into bonds because they know that the Federal Reserve has their bank. If you know that the Federal Reserve Bank will bail you out no matter what, you're gonna feel a whole lot more confident putting your money into the stock market, and they believe that this will help stabilize the economy. Now look, there is a benefit to having a strong stock market, because when people feel wealthier, you're gonna be more willing to go out and spend money. If you feel that you're really wealthy because your stocks are soaring, and you're more likely to go out and spend money, that's good for the economy, because now businesses will be making more money, and if they have more money, they'll be willing to reinvest and hire more employees and grow their company, but if people are not making money in the stock market, they're going to be less likely to invest. But on the flip side, there's also a cost for the Federal Reserve Bank printing $120 billion every single month and injecting this into the market because on one hand, you have a market that's reliant on the Federal Reserve Bank printing money and keeping it on float. And secondly, you have an economy where our dollars are losing value each and every day and every single month that the Federal Reserve Bank prints more money, every single time they print another $120 billion, the value of your savings, the value of each dollar that you earn goes down just a little bit. Now at this point, the obvious question everybody will have is, so why doesn't the Federal Reserve Bank just pull the plug? 
why don't they just stop pouring money into the market and let the market do its thing? I mean, we saw the same thing happen after the 2008 crash. After the 2008 crash, the Federal Reserve Bank started printing money like crazy. They started pouring it into the market. That way the stock market would rebound. That way people would feel more comfortable pouring their money into the market. And then one day the Federal Reserve Bank said enough's enough. And then they pulled the money printer and they stopped pouring money into the market. And we saw a small stock market crash. It was called the taper tantrum because, you know, investors had a tantrum when they heard that the Federal Reserve Bank wasn't pouring more money into the market and that caused a small stock market crash. So now the Federal Reserve Bank is worried about the same thing. They don't want to see another taper tantrum happen, so they don't know what to do. That's why they're continuing to pump money into the market. They want to continue to see inflation happen, but they don't want to see super high inflation because if inflation was super high, people would panic, they would get worried, they would start attacking the Federal Reserve Bank. And so they're saying that inflation is high, but it's not super high, you know, because they take out all the high numbers. Because of that, they have more justification to continuing following their measures, meaning continuing pumping free and cheap money into the market, keeping interest rates very low, keep pumping money into the markets that way people feel confident in the economy because they believe that if you keep money cheap it'll be easier for the economy to grow and get up and running but all this comes at a cost because the government will have to pay all this money back plus interest which is one of the reasons why now president joe biden wants to raise taxes because if you raise taxes they'll have more tax dollars and now more of your tax dollars are going to be going to pay back the government's debt plus interest. Not to mention the fact that the Federal Reserve Bank and the government want to see more inflation because inflation makes the value of a dollar less, which makes it cheaper for the government to be able to afford their debt that they have. Now, the government and the Fed don't like to talk about this, but the reality is if we see less inflation, if we start to see interest rates go up, now all of a sudden, this $28 trillion worth of national debt that the United States government owes becomes a whole lot more expensive because the government is going to have to use more valuable dollars to pay off their debt. But if you see more inflation and cheaper interest rates, now this $28 trillion worth of national debt that the US has is more accessible to pay off because now the government is paying down their debt with cheaper dollars. So if dollars become more powerful, more valuable, this debt becomes a whole lot more burdensome on the United States government, which is why the government and the Federal Reserve Bank want to continue to see low interest rates. And that's why they want to continue to see cheap money because it makes it easier for the government to continue making their debt payments, especially at a time where our economy is still slow. Our economy is still struggling to get up and running, even though, yeah, it's way better than it was back in 2020 when the economy was shut down. But compared to our debt levels, compared to where we need to be, our economy isn't growing as fast as we would like, which is why you're still seeing stimulus by the Federal Reserve Bank, which is why you're still seeing the government working to get the economy moving and getting people back to work. And this is why Michael Burry says that he's worried about more inflation happening because the Federal Reserve Bank is skewing their numbers right now to make it seem like inflation is less. That way they can continue justifying all their money printing and all this money printing is gonna eventually add up because we just keep adding more inflation, adding more inflation, adding more inflation, which is looting the value of our dollars, which means that while the Federal Reserve Bank says that we're going to see less and less inflation and the price of things are going to go back to normal in just a few months or maybe in 2020, the price of things are going to go back down drastically and everything will go back to normal because the supply chain issues will be better. Michael Burry says no. He says that we're going to see more inflation because yeah, maybe inflation will slow down when we start to see the money printing die down. But that doesn't mean the price of things are going to go back because according to him, it's not just the supply chain issues causing inflation, it is the dilution of the value of a dollar caused by the Federal Reserve Bank, which is causing the inflation that we're seeing right now. So what do you do? For one, get educated about money because inflation hurts the people who are not financially educated and it benefits the people who are financially educated. So start learning about money. We have tons of resources on our channel. We have tons of videos on our channel. So if you haven't checked those out, make sure you do that. And if you want to learn more about investing your money in the stock market the right way, you can get a free 10 day trial to our Stock Market Insiders program and I'll put the link to that in the description below. If you like what you saw so far, then you're gonna love this. Knowing how much money you need in order to live financially free is one of the most important financial questions you can ask yourself. I got my handy dandy whiteboard because today I wanna go over how far a million dollars can actually go. How you use your million dollars is gonna depend on a couple different things. It's gonna depend on how you spend your money and it's gonna depend on how you actually use your million dollars. So let's start by talking about you using a million dollars to live a million dollar lifestyle. If you want to go out and live that millionaire lifestyle, then you're probably going to keep this million dollars in cash in your bank. That way you can access it very easily 
And now what you're going to do is you're going to go out and you want to look good on Instagram. So you're going to buy yourself, let's say, a half a million dollar house with cash that we don't have to deal with any mortgage payments. And then you're going to buy yourself a nice $200,000, maybe an Audi R8, a nice supercar. You're going to go on a few vacations. So there's a plane, looks like a plane. And in a couple of years, you are going to be broke. So if you want to live the Instagram flexing lifestyle, then the million dollars is not going to last you very long. This should be pretty obvious. If you subscribe to a YouTube channel, you understand that it doesn't really matter how much money you make. It's what you do with the money you make. Even if you have a million dollars, you can go broke almost instantly if you don't know how to use your money the right way. And if you're not subscribed to a YouTube channel, you should do that. But this is why so many high paid athletes and so many high paid lottery winners end up broke so quickly. It's because you make a ton of money, but you don't have any financial education. So what do you do when you make a lot of money? You blow it. Now, when you blow all this money you have, you have a bunch of nice things, but you have no money left. This is the majority mindset way of spending money. You make a ton of money and then you blow it on a bunch of nice things that make you look rich, but they keep you broke. And so this is going to be a big no-no when you make a million dollars. Now, don't get me wrong. I want you to own a nice home and I want you to drive a nice car and I want you to go on nice vacations, but I want to make sure you can afford it. That way you have cash to live your life financially free. So let's go into the second way that you can use your money. Now let's assume that you have this million dollars, but you're conservative. You don't like the whole idea of investing your money because you don't want to throw your money in the stock market and see this million dollars get sliced in half if the stock market crashes. So you want to be safe and you just put this money in the bank. This is how I grew up learning about money. I grew up in a traditional Indian house and Indian people love saving money. It is like in our blood. And so Indian people make a dollar to spend 20 cents and save 80 cents. Well, in the American culture, it is very common to make a dollar and then spend a dollar 20 with lines of credit and credit cards and loans. And so Indian people are born with that saving mentality. And so what do you do? You make money and then you save as much money as possible and you don't want to invest it because investing is risky. And so you build this huge savings cushion that way you can live wealthy. Now, saving your money is better than blowing all of your money on nice cars and clothes, but it doesn't give you the full potential of your money because your money is just sitting there flat and is getting eaten away by inflation. I already made a video where I talk about if you can get rich by being cheap. So if you want to learn more about that, I'll link it for you in the description below. In the financial world, there is something called the 4% rule, which says you take your savings and investments and you add it up and then you live off of 4% of that a year and you adjust it for inflation. So in this example, I'm going to take a modified version of this 4% rule and say that you want to live off of just $40,000 a year, which is 4% of your million dollars you saved up in cash. If you live off of $40,000 a year, then this million dollars is going to last you 25 years because now you're not investing your money. This million dollars is just sitting in your bank account and every single year, you're just going to draw out $40,000. So January 1st, every year you draw out $40,000 and you live off of the $40,000 for 12 months. If you continue to do that, you will be able to live off of your million dollars for 25 years. After 25 years, you're not going to have any more money. I'm assuming for the sake of this example that this million dollars is just sitting in your bank account and it's not growing at all because right now savings accounts are not paying you anything. So if your million dollars is not growing and you're just pulling out $40,000 a year, then you will be able to live off of this money for 25 years and you will be living a $40,000 a year lifestyle. But this doesn't factor in inflation because as you know, the value of our money doesn't stay the same. That's why $100 today can't buy as much as $100 could back in 1970 because our money is slowly losing value over time because of inflation. Now, if we factor inflation into this and now you're not pulling out $40,000 every single year, you pull out $40,000 this year and then you pull out a little bit more money next year and then a little bit more money after that by factoring in a 2% inflation rate. Now, you're not going to have enough money to live off of this million dollars for 25 years. You're going to have enough money to live off of for 21 years. So if you want to live a $40,000 lifestyle, then you can expect this money to last you for 21 to 25 years, depending on what inflation is, if you have a million dollars. 
dollars. Now, if you want to live a hundred thousand dollar a year lifestyle, you can just adjust the numbers. So if your goal is just to save your money that you can draw cash out of, well, now you can do the math to see how long this money is going to actually last you. Now, this time, instead of saving your cash, let's say you have the minority mindset where you invest your cash and you want passive income. So you invest your money in the stock market for dividends. And I'm going to give you two different scenarios. Scenario one, you invest it in McDonald's, MCD, or you invest it in IBM. So scenario one, you invest all million dollars into McDonald's and scenario two, you invest all million dollars into IBM. Now, look, I am just a random guy on YouTube, okay? So don't blindly listen to anything I say and make sure you do your own research. I do not recommend that you take all of your cash and throw it into one stock just because of the dividend. This is just a hypothetical. Some companies in the stock market like McDonald's and IBM at the time of me recording this video make a lot of money. And at the end of the year, they have a whole bunch of cash in their bank account and they just don't know how to invest all this money back into their business. And so what they do is they take this cash and they just give it away to their investors people like you who invest in their stock. So if you go out and you invest in one share of McDonald's or one share of IBM, then you will get these passive income checks called dividends deposited directly into your account. At the time of me recording this video, McDonald's pays a two and a half percent dividend, which means if you invest a million dollars into the McDonald's stock, you will make $25,000 a year from your McDonald's investment. IBM, on the other hand, pays out around a 5% dividend yield right now, which means if you invest a million dollars into IBM, you will make $50,000 a year in passive income from dividends. So you still own your investment, but every year you're getting a check from McDonald's or from IBM for doing nothing except just owning their stock. So you don't have to sell your stock to get these dividend checks. You just own the stock and then every three months, every quarter, you are going to get a check from McDonald's or IBM. Before you go out and you start living this $50,000 or $25,000 a year lifestyle from your passive income, remember the government wants their cut, so you gotta pay taxes. Luckily, dividend income has a lower tax rate because the government wants to incentivize you to invest your money and get this type of passive income so they reward you with lower taxes. If you make between zero and $40,000 a year in taxable income at the time of me recording this video, you have to pay 0% of your money in taxes. If you make between $40,000 and $441,000 a year in taxable income, then on your dividends, you have to pay 15% in taxes. And if you make more than $441,000 a year, then you are paying 20% a year in taxes on your dividends. At this point, you might be thinking, why in the world would anybody want to invest in McDonald's where you can only make a 2.5% dividend when you can invest in IBM and make a 5% annual dividend? Well, there's a little bit more to what meets the eye. Over the last two decades or so, the price of IBM stock has stayed pretty much flat. And over the last decade, the last 10 years, IBM stock has actually come down about 10%. So if you invested this million dollars into IBM, it hasn't really gone anywhere. And if anything, if you invested over the last decade, it has come down, even though you're making more money in dividends here. With McDonald's, on the other hand, the price of the stock has gone up five-fold over the last couple of decades. And over the last decade, the price of the stock has doubled. So if you invested this million dollars into McDonald's a decade ago, this would be worth about $2 million. And if you invested into them five years ago, this would be worth about $5 million even though your dividends aren't as big. So you have to understand there's a little bit more to what meets the eye because there's more to investing than just the dividend price, which is why you do not want to make your investment decisions based solely on this dividend percentage. You want to look at the underlying fundamentals of the company and you want to make sure you're investing in a company that's growing, that you believe in for the future, because if you do that, then you're going to make a whole lot more money than just this dividend price. Now, past performance does not predict the future performance in any way, but but I just want you to understand this because if you invested a million dollars here versus a million dollars here, then you are going to make less money in passive income for a little while here. But you could also pull some of your stock out and sell some of your stock and have some cash and still see the stock growth and still see the value of your million dollars grow while having more cash in your hand. In any case, with both of these examples, you have income that you can use to live off of every single year and you also still have this million dollar nest egg. Now, if the price of the stock goes down, the value of your investment will go down too, 
but in general, you still have a big chunk of your investment just sitting there invested in one of these companies, and you also have passive income that you can live off of without selling any of your investment. The third thing that you can do with this money is you say, you know what, I don't wanna invest my money for dividends, I wanna invest my money in the stock market to see my money grow, but I don't know which stock to put my company in, so I'm just gonna put my money in the stock market, and if the stock market goes up, my million dollars will go up, and if the stock market goes down, well, I will take that risk. And now what you're planning on doing is taking out a little bit of your profits every single year or taking out a little bit of your equity rather every single year. And if you have profits, then that's just icing on the top. Now, instead of just keeping your money in cash in the bank, you're putting your money to work by putting it into something like VOO or SPY. These are two funds that give you exposure to the broader stock market. VOO and SPY both give you exposure to the top 500 companies in the stock market. So now if the stock market goes up, your fund will go up and if the stock market goes down your fund generally goes down you can draw cash out just like you could in the bank but now you have a little bit more risk because if the stock market goes down the value of your million dollars will go down too to put some numbers on this for context in december of 2010 voo was trading for around 110 dollars a share and spy was trading for around 125 dollars a share then in December 2020, one decade later, VOO went from $100 a share to around $340 a share, and SPY went up to $375 a share. So both of these funds saw right around a 300% increase over one decade between December 2010 and December 2020. What this tells us is if you put a million dollars here or here in December 2010, you would have something around $3 million over here. But the issue with that is that you don't have any money to live off of for this decade. So if you live off of 6% of your income now, so meaning in 2010, you take $60,000 out. So now you have $940,000 to invest and you put it here or here, you would still see a profitable growth. That means now you're not taking out 4% like I talked about before, you're taking out $60,000 or 6% or whatever your pool is every single year, and you're still seeing a profitable growth because you're seeing more than a 10% growth on your money year after year after year. So you're pulling out 6%, but your money is growing by 10%, so although you're taking out more money than before, your money is still growing faster than what you're pulling out. In this situation, you have a couple benefits. You get to pull out more cash than you did before, so you can live a bigger lifestyle, and you still have your nest egg, and your nest egg is growing on top of that. Before, when you just saved a million dollars, every time you pulled money out, your nest egg grew smaller, so you had less and less cash available. Now, you're pulling more money out, but your nest egg keeps growing bigger. Now, I know you're probably thinking, but just breathe, just because the stock market went up in the past doesn't mean it's gonna continue to go up at the same rate in the future. You're 100% right. Maybe the stock market will go down. Maybe it will stay flat. Maybe it will go up faster than this. Maybe it'll go up slower than this. There's no way to predict that, but this is the risk you take from you investing your money. And that's also why more risk comes with more potential reward. Now, I should also mention that when you pull out cash in this situation, when you sell your stock and you have a profit, you have to pay taxes on your profits. That doesn't mean you pay taxes on every dollar you pull out because some of this money, this million dollars is yours. So when you pull this million dollars out, you don't pay any taxes. There's lower tax rates that I talked about earlier. If you don't like the idea of owning these paper investments like stocks and you wanna own a tangible physical investment that you can see that will pay you passive income, then you can look into investing in real estate. So real estate is my favorite investment class just because I like the idea of creating passive income through owning a physical asset. I'm trying to draw an apartment complex here, so bear with me. I hope that looks like an apartment. But when you buy an investment like real estate, now you own something physical that you can see, feel, and touch like this property. And now what your goal is, is to own this property and put tenants, people into this property who are going to live there or use your property. And in exchange for them using your property, they're going to pay you rent every single month. So you don't have to do any physical work to earn this income because once you own the asset, you can hire a management company or a property manager to do all the physical day-to-day -day work, but you will get this passive income every single month because people are living in or using your property. And for them to do that, they have to pay you rent. When I invest in real estate, my goal is to get a minimum 7% annual return on my money. So if you invest a million dollars into a property, let's say you buy a small apartment complex, then my goal would be to make $70,000 dollars a year in passive income profits after paying all your expenses from owning this property. So after paying all your expenses, you should be left with $70,000 in your bank account. 
At first glance, you're making the most money here. But don't forget about taxes because you got to pay taxes on your income. Now, as an attorney, I can tell you that real estate has a bunch of legal tax loopholes that you can use. Now, although I am an attorney, I am not your attorney. So if you have specific tax questions, make sure you talk to a tax specialist in your area. Now, what you can do with real estate here is you could tell the government, hey, yeah, I made $70,000, but I don't want to pay taxes on all $70,000 because my property is a year older. And so what you get to do if you have a million dollar property is you get to take a $25,000 deduction every single year for the next 30 or so years because the property that you own is just one year older. And so you get to tell the government, I'm only gonna pay taxes on $45,000, even though I made $70,000, because you get to take this deduction called the depreciation deduction every single year for just under 30 years because you are investing in real estate. And that's just one of the loopholes you get for investing in real estate. So if we calculate this out, if you tell the IRS that you made $45,000 in income from your real estate property, you're gonna have to pay around $5,000 in taxes because you don't have to pay social security taxes or medicare taxes you only have to pay your income taxes which means you are going to be left with right around sixty five thousand dollars you made seventy thousand dollars you only pay taxes on forty five thousand dollars and you will be left with about sixty five thousand dollars that you can use to live your life and you still own this million dollar property now, there are some other legal loopholes that you can use in real estate to lower your taxable income even lower, but I'm not gonna go over all of that in this video. Hopefully, you'll see your property value go up, which will add some icing on top of this passive income, but when I analyze my real estate investment deals, I'm looking at this, the passive income. I'm not looking at what potential value this could go up to because I just wanna see how much money I can make every single month. As a quick little tip on this, real estate does have more risk because now you have to physically manage this property and deal with tenants and work with property managers and work with real estate agents and work with contractors so there's more upfront work required and there's more of kind of like a skill set required because now you're not just investing in a company like McDonald's and IBM and letting them handle the investment you are the one managing your investment here so now if we really analyze how far a million dollars can take you it depends on how you use your cash if you just save the million dollars that means you will be able to live off of let's say forty thousand dollars a year and you have 21 to 25 years of money after the 21 to 25 years your money is gone and you have no money left if you invest this money into dividend paying stocks like the mcdonald's or ibm that we discussed then you can expect to make somewhere between twenty five thousand and fifty thousand dollars a year to live off of based on today's numbers and this will last you as long as the company is strong because now you're owning an investment that will continue to pay you dividends as long as the economy is strong and as long as the company that you're investing in is making money. If you invested this money into an index like VOO or SPY that gives you exposure to the general stock market, then we're talking about something like $60,000 a year based off of the historical numbers that we saw. And again, how long will this last? Well, as long as the economy is growing and the stock market is growing. These come with more risk than this, but there's more potential to make more money. And if you invest this money into real estate, then hopefully, depending on where you live, you should be able to make about $70,000 a year in passive income. Again, these are all pre-tax numbers. And how long will this last you? Well. It depends on how good the area is that you invest in. If the location continues to thrive, then you will be able to make money from that property for generations. But if the area that you're investing in starts to tank and people move away, then you might not continue to see the same rental income that you're seeing right now. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, here's a video on things you should not do when you get paid that I think you love. And while you edit, download our free guide on how to start generating passive income. And as always, keep hustling. The fourth way and probably the most common way that people become wealthy is again, a combination of four and five, but it goes into education. I'm speaking more of the kind of like your traditional education,